All right, so we're going to try to keep this to about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, first and foremost, I'm Jeff Leach. Uh, also with us from SiriusXM is Dan Dickerson. Dan and I both work out of the Washington, D.C. office. My sole responsibility is SiriusXM Marine. Dan covers SiriusXM Marine and aviation. And we have John Spittle from Garmin. Uh, John's the training expert. John, you can hear us, right? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Awesome. Thank you for taking the time in the evening to join us. And then we also are fortunate to have Ryan Farner. Ryan is a SiriusXM and Garmin Pro Angler. He runs the uh, Viking Mighty Mouse. Uh, Ryan, if you're on, remind me the length of uh, the Viking. 70, 70 Viking. 70, okay, got it. And the contender's a 35, correct? It is, it is, yes, sir. Great. So if you guys have specific questions from somebody who's out there fishing all the time on the Viking and the contender in the Keys, in the Tampa area, um, Ryan uses this service literally daily. So he's going to chime in uh, occasionally. But if you have specific questions for Ryan, uh, please chat those to us as well, and we'll answer those. Um, all right. So going ahead and getting started here for anybody who is not familiar with our services Sirius XM Marines kind of claim to fame in the offshore world is that uh, you can see our service. It's not contingent on cell phone or internet. You can see it on your multifunction display um, up to 150 to 200 miles offshore. So if you're looking at this map of North America, the light blue area is roughly our coverage area. So more than enough area to get out to your fishing grounds uh, if you're off the east and west coast. Um, and you don't have to look at your cell phone. This is not an app, but again, it's satellite based. When you set up Garmin uh, weather on your chart plotter, you'll see uh, several icons on your home screen that say SXM, that's Sirius XM. Here are the weather icons, and then you have a dedicated fish mapping icon. It's important to note that when you click on fish mapping, you will not have weather access you'll have to go back to this home screen and, and get weather access to access all the weather features. Uh, we didn't want to overload fish mapping and all the layers on that with, with weather screens. It would just be too complicated. All right, it does still work as a navigation screen though. You will see your boat on the screen. You can mark a waypoint. So some of the basic navigation functions you will still have. Good point, thank you. All right, uh, so for those of you, uh, again, uh, who are getting fish mapping and are not familiar with our weather service, fish mapping comes with our highest tier of weather. So you will have all of the features of offshore weather is the name of our highest tier of weather, uh, a few of which are animated uh, weather radar, uh, lightning strikes, uh, and then we've also shown you our graphical sea surface temperatures on this chart, and that's just part of your weather service. There's a ton more features. And again, we will go through Garmin weather features specifically next Thursday, the 29th. All right, fish mapping has eight dedicated features. So on top of all the weather features, it has eight dedicated features. And we're gonna walk through those the way that they appear on your Garmin plotter. First and foremost, let's talk about our data. So we partnered with a company called Maxar Technologies. This is a big publicly traded company, probably best known or most well known for their Google Earth imagery. They supply Google Earth with all the satellite imagery uh, that they use. Uh, Maxar has a team of oceanographers that collect and analyze the raw data from NASA, NOAA satellites and other sources. Uh, and they've been working internationally with the commercial uh, governments and commercial fishing industries uh, for several decades now. Um, so a great partner for us to have. Okay, so starting off, once you have fish mapping loaded, you hit that fish mapping button on the home screen, uh, you're gonna have a, a layers menu uh, that gives you your choice of features. So there is a sea temperature, there's a plankton button, uh, and those two, there are sub menus. So we have three types of sea temperature information, surface contours, surface front strength, and 30 meters subsurface, that's 100 feet down, we're giving you uh, temperature contours. And then plankton concentration, which is just a contours and the front strength. And then uh, we have sea surface height anomaly, weed lines and fishing recommendations. And you'll notice there's a green bar that shows up. Uh, this tells you that the layer is turned on and you should be seeing some data on your screen. 
So going back to the, uh, the chart screen that comes up when you hit the fish mapping button, uh, if you select the menu first, and that brings up this uh, series of buttons over here on the side, um, first we'd like you to go to the subscription uh, page. And especially if you're a new user uh, or if you're just logging on and you wanna make sure this is where you see if the data is really there or not and, and see what the timestamp is. So this screen gives you two pieces of information and it automatically shifts back and forth between the two columns, giving you the, uh, the time that the data was updated. That's the time that we got the data from Maxar. Uh, and then the, um, the other field is the time that it loaded into your machine. So fish mapping uh, information is uh, reset every 20 minutes. Uh, so that timestamp that you see there should really never be more than 20. And what we're looking at, it, it's uh, uh, three minutes uh, and 54 seconds old, for example, when I took this shot. Uh, so that's your timestamp on your, on your information. And, and, and an important thing, if you go back to that screen real fast, Dan, not to be long here, um, when you first turn on fish mapping, it may take a little while for various features to load. So don't get frustrated or think that your service is broken. Just take a look at the subscription page and you'll see when each one of those load in your plotter. And as Dan mentioned, that could take up to 20 minutes. Dan, can you also tell us about signal strength up in the right-hand top corner of this? Uh, sure, another thing to look at, especially if you're not seeing any data coming in, is to take a look at these icons up in the corner. Now, the one in the extreme far right, we're not concerned about as much, that's your GPS signal strength. And there's always pretty much, you know, you're gonna have your position information. Uh, the, the next one to it is a cloud with a lightning bolt. That's the weather signal right there. So that's the one that includes the fish mapping data. That's the one to be, to be aware of. And if you have uh, two bars or less, it's going to slow down the loading process. So typically on a, on a you know, good installation, uh, you're going to have three or more bars at all times. And the last one, the SXM over here on the left, that's if you have a separate uh, stereo receiver, um, that one will, will give you your, your, your audio uh, signal strength. That's what the, the third icon is for. That's for the music, basically the music signal and the, the one with the cloud is the weather, uh, weather signal. So talking about the, the different layers of information and update times, uh, the sea surface temperature information uh, is updated every three hours. We get new data from our supplier. And then for daily updates, we have sea surface temperature fronts, the 30 meter subsurface temperatures, the plankton concentrations, the plankton fronts, the sea surface height anomalies and weed lines, those are all updated daily uh, by Maxar. And then lastly, we have fishing recommendations. Those are only released twice a week. Uh, they're put out on Tuesday and Friday morning. All of the information you see that's updated daily and the information updated twice a week, these are all on the feed by 5 a.m. every morning. Uh, or not every morning for the updated daily and then twice a week by Tuesday and Friday at 5 a.m. Uh, so you have it basically around the time that you're leaving the dock. So going back to the, the charting screen, um, we're gonna bring up the menu again and, and select from the layers menu. Uh, we go to sea surface temperature and select surface contours. And this is how they're gonna appear on screen. Those of you that have used the offshore weather before, you've seen color palettes showing you what the temperature is, and you can click on and, and get the, uh, the temperature where the various colors show up. Uh, here, uh, we basically just simplified that, and we're showing contour lines where the temperatures are in two degree increments. So you can see we have a 76 degree temperature here, and, and further up north, we're looking at a 48 degree temperature. Now there's also a sea temp limit uh, button. And what you can do here is go in and adjust the temperature uh, to give you a little bit better clarity. Here we're looking at the, the, the normal default, which is 32 degrees to 99 degrees. If we go in and change those settings, 
you'll see how the color changes on screen. The, the higher temperatures have now, the contour lines have become much darker. It's just an easy way to, to better highlight a temperature break. If you're looking for a, a species that's, you know, in, gonna, you're gonna find it in a specific temperature range, you can set those limits so you can better see where that temperature field lies. So next, moving on to surface front strength. This is sea surface temperature front strengths. And what we've done here is, or what Maxar has done, is the oceanographers take a look at the sea surface temperature data, and they also look at the current information and other variables about the sea conditions, and they outline where the most drastic temperature breaks are, where the most productive uh, temperature breaks are going to be, and it's done on a number scale of just one to four. So these are our temperature fronts. Uh, you'll see that uh, a number one is shown as a weak, and it's going to be a lighter colored uh, line, and then we go from, from one to, to two to three, and finally to four. And, and realistically, where you're going to find bait fish, where you're going to find activity is, is most likely going to be where there's a number three or a number four temperature break or temperature front. The, these are the, we're finding that these are the most productive areas. Uh, one of these strong fronts will also oftentimes produce a small rip current and it'll trap scattered weeds along those lines. I have a lot of our fishermen are reporting back saying they, they found uh, weed lines along a, a temp front. Moving on to the 30 meter subsurface contours. This looks very similar to your regular surface contours. The difference is it's based on a software algorithm uh, that Maxar uses and they've been doing this for, I believe it's about 20 years now and it's proven to be very accurate at giving the temperatures at 100 feet down. And there's no way of detecting the, the temperature between those ranges. You're, you're gonna, from your surface contours, you're gonna get the water surface temperatures. And then the subsurface is gonna be at, at minus 30 meters. So 30 meters down. And this is, uh, information is given in 10th of a degree increments. So you'll see I've got a, a 71.6 showing on screen and, and 53.6 above that. So the, the temperature range is different. Now, the advantage to subsurface temperatures can best be explained by looking at the two pieces of information side by side. Now, this picture was taken uh, not that long ago, and you can clearly see where the Gulf Stream is. This is off the coast of Delaware. And you can see our surface temperature is uh, 60, 62 degrees where I have the cursor, and it's 68 degrees where I have the cursor on the subsurface side. Now that cursor position is exact same Latin long. This was taken exact same time. I just split screens and took a shot at both at the same time. So you can see there's, there's quite a difference in, in temperature variance. And not only in areas uh, here where we see the Gulf Stream making a difference, but where you're gonna find this to be an advantage is uh, for example, in the summertime in Florida, when the surface water is almost all the same temperature everywhere, being able to see where that cooler water is underneath at a glance before you even leave the dock is going to be very helpful in getting to the, a good fishing ground. All right, uh, we're gonna look over questions here, people's chat, thank you. It looks like there are maybe a few questions. Um, Ryan, do you wanna chime in, remember you may be on mute, uh, about how you use uh, the sea surface temperature information? Uh, yes, thanks for uh, asking. Uh, I use it a lot in kinda, we make long runs, so you wanna zero in your temperature break areas to, you know, the, the closest points are where they pile up on each other in the higher numbers. You know, for example, moderate, strong um, temperature front strength is very important to me. I know that that's a good current. I also will toggle back and go to sub sea surface temperature and see exactly what John was just discussing on the subsurface to see where the points are below it. And then I get a really good idea of how that little current funnels through that little eddy or, you know, that part of the reef or 
on on the edge where we're fishing in the Gulf or wherever wherever we are. It, it's it's very accurate if you can if you if you look at it and follow you know the guidelines. All right, thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Um, a couple questions. Uh, one one person already chimed in about the uh, weather receiver necessary. We are going to talk about that. But to get fish mapping, you do need the newest GXM54, which came out about a year and a half ago, uh, not the GXM53. 53 and lower, 52 and others do not get uh, fish mapping. The other question was a really appropriate one about cloud cover. And thank you for asking that question. We, um, we didn't mention that. We have just instituted uh, new data for sea surface temperature that will not be impacted by cloud cover. Traditionally, our sea surface temperatures have been impacted. Uh, if there are clouds on a day, uh, you will not get uh, that most up-to-date sea surface temperatures. But that is no longer the case, uh, and that is already live uh, in our system. Anything else to add to that, Dan, that I may have missed? Yeah, the, for the temperature change, the change that we made, there was no upgrade required. Uh, so it just automatically the the sea surface temperature information was was you know just slightly altered and and newer and better and um, that's that's about it. Good. All right. So let's now jump into. Is there one more question? Let's see here. Great. All right. Um, keep the questions coming. By the way, um, good questions, and um, we're going to talk about plankton. Otherwise, uh, some people use the term chlorophyll. Uh, for all intents and purposes, we use uh, the word, uh, the term plankton. First and foremost, as you see it on your plotter, is plankton concentration contours. These are the contour lines that denote plankton in, if you can look at the legend up here, milligrams per cubic meter, so the density of plankton. Much like sea surface temperature contours, uh, these are, you see a uh, grading scale, the lighter shades are the less dense areas, the darker shades are the more dense areas of plankton concentrations. The next feature in plankton is plankton front strengths, a very useful feature here that we encourage people to use, much like sea surface temperature fronts that Dan was just talking about, these are graded on a scale. Of course, we, on this particular instance, we took out number one. So there is no weak plankton front. It's only a two, which is a moderate, a three, which is a strong, and a four, which is a very strong. So what we're looking at here and what we're talking about in these front lines is areas where there is a um, significant delineation between rich, dense plankton and, and water that's not as dense. So you're looking for those fronts and those tend to be the places where bait fish congregate. And of course the pelagic fish uh, will pick off those, those uh, bait fish in those really nutrient rich plankton filled areas. In some cases, not always, you may see that turbid water, that darker colored water. If you've, if you've ever seen that offshore, I'm sure a lot of people in this call have where you're you're going out and all of a sudden there's a, a very clear transition in water clarity where one area is a, a deeper, richer kind of green and, and then it transitions maybe to a clear blue. Um, so plankton fronts are a really important feature. Any questions about this? Just keep, keep the chats coming. All right. Uh, this uh, is just to, to make a point and to, and to show you how valuable plankton fronts can be. On the left-hand side of the screen, we are showing you our traditional sea surface temperature, the way it is uh, graphically represented as a color. Um, and, and, and as you can see in this particular instance, which is off of Miami, the color is really monochrome. There's not a substantial difference in sea surface temperatures color looks pretty much the same throughout. So just based on SST or sea surface temperatures, if you were out offshore, you'd have no idea where those breaks are. But then look at the exact same area. So if you take that X right there, there's the exact same area, the exact same time, you've got a very strong plankton front. So in the absence of sea surface temperature data, you've got plankton front data, critical. And we've now heard from two or three people just in the last month or so, because we know it's sailfish season, that right here have caught sailfish. In fact, uh, several sailfish that helped one of the groups uh, you know, win a, a recent tournament this winter. So um, remember, it's all about using the various lay layers. And what, what is not there in some particular instance, turn on a different feature and see if that is there. 
And we're gonna talk more about that, about combining layers, et cetera, as we move forward. All right. Now we're gonna talk about surface height anomaly. So this is the average height of the ocean. So the average shows up as a zero, and this is a little bit confusing um, to understand. So we're talking about upwellings, downwellings, uh, and then of course, uh, eddies that happen. So in this particular instance, if you look at this upwelling area, and this is a bit counterintuitive, you're seeing a negative number. You see right here, negative 13.77, that is in inches. So what this means is the sea surface is 13.77 inches beneath the average height of the ocean. Um, conversely, oops, excuse me. Conversely, a downwelling is above the surface. In this particular instance, 9.84 inches above the surface. So let's use some graphical uh, examples of how this works. But first, just know that an upwelling creates a counterclockwise eddy. I know a lot of people on this call are probably looking for eddies or familiar with seeing eddies out there. Downwellings create clockwise eddies. Here's a, a graphical representation of an upwelling. So what is happening is the sea surface height is lower in this particular case, which means that to get back to that average sea surface height, it is bringing up nutrient rich water from the bottom. So it's bringing it, sucking it up, bringing it up to the surface. Conversely, a downwelling is where the height of the ocean is already high and it is falling, more or less flushing that water out and not having very rich nutrients in that area. More importantly is the area between these two eddy, eddies. And it's really important to note that just these lines really in and of themselves are not as important as seeing two circular patterns next to each other. So adjacent circular patterns denote that there's two eddies next to each other. And the critical area where the bait fish congregate almost get trapped between those water columns is those areas where you see the contours transitioning rapidly. So in this particular case, it's called a convergence zone. You're looking at a zero where that's average sea surface height. And then you've got positives on one side of the line and negatives. That's referred to as a convergence zone and uh, tends to be the best place to find bait fish. And of course, the pelagics are fish are eating on the on the bait fish. And the There's closer a, those uh, lines are together, the better it is. That means the stronger the 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 vertical column is. The vertical current is on those areas. Here's a uh, graphical representation of that. Uh, oceanographers say typically between you know negative two inches and positive two inches uh, is really your best area of convergence zone between those those two eddies. All right, uh, looks like there may be some questions here. Yeah, we do have a, a couple of questions. The the first one was asking uh, if fish mapping is available on iPad or available to view at home. You know, before you head down to the boat. And uh, at this time, it is not. Um, we, we, we needed to get it out there and, and satellite delivered first. So we'll, we'll see what the future holds for being able to view fish mapping ahead of time. Uh, next, there was a question about combining layers. And just to quickly answer, yes, you can. We'll show you an example of that a little bit further along in the presentation. Um, and lastly, Jeff, there was a question about plankton. Uh, is the plankton usually on the green nearer shore side of the color change? Geez, I'm not sure I, I have the answer to that. I don't think I've studied plankton and in, in its near shore or not uh, enough. Maybe somebody on the call who's familiar you know, with plankton in particular and looking carefully at that on a regular basis could answer that, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. You know, I will say basically the, the, the plankton contour lines, they do change color. They go from a light green to a dark green and the dark green is the stronger uh, 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 concentration. Uh, from my experience, uh, the concentrations do usually build in, up closer to shore, but not always. Um, and I do, I tend to use the plankton front information more than the plankton concentration information. Uh, that's something that's, uh, you know, it's, it's letting the oceanographers do part of the work um, and indicating where the best areas to go are. And, and certainly as Jeff mentioned on a strong plankton front, uh, you know, you, you, 
you can often see a, a change in water color uh, that is, you know, that we like to see. Yeah, Dan, will you answer the question too? I know we were talking about pre-planning and plotting waypoints, et cetera. To briefly touch on plotting waypoints using fish mapping as well as bathymetry, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, um, we, I think we do have a, a slide further on, but uh, the, uh, the contour lines that you see on your fishing chart or on your navigation chart, those at this time do not show up on the fish mapping screen. The fish mapping, it just gives you the basic chart. Uh, so if you want to see contour lines and compare them to where the, the temp fronts are, uh, what you'll need to do is, is set up a, a combo screen. Uh, so you can have your, your fishing chart on one side and your fish mapping chart on the other side. And of course, the boat position will stay in the same on both screens. So you can better reference uh, where the uh, bathymetry is. Yep. And when Dan says contour lines, he's referring to bathymetry contour lines. For, for obvious reasons, Garmin did not include bathymetry over top of a, a bunch of other contour lines that are included in fish mapping because it would just look like a bowl of spaghetti. Uh, but that split screen option is, is your best bet. All right. Okay. So moving on. Oh, there's one more question, Dan, before we move on. Can you please go back to the slide of uplines and downlines with the clockwise, counterclockwise, just for a second? Sure. <clears throat> go the, the, I'm trying. Yeah. It's not working. Did you touch the mouse? You did. Here, I can do it. You? I got it. There you go, and you 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 can find this. Uh, there's quite a few videos online about this as well. Okay. All right, Dan, I will uh, drive you to. There you go. All you. Okay. So next topic is weed lines. With weed lines selected, if there are any in your area, you're going to see these magenta colored shapes show up. And they will be all different shapes and sizes. Uh, and it's important to note that weed data is recorded once a day. We only get one shot. It's a, it's a satellite uh, that only uh, goes by once a day. So we only have uh, one chance at this. Um, and the shapes are not an exact representation of what the weed is going to actually look like out there. You'll see several variations. Uh, basically, the way this information is gathered uh, is the satellite uh, basically takes a photograph of the ocean surface, and then there's a software algorithm that scans it, looking at the reflectivity of the water. And from the reflectivity of the water, they're able to determine uh, possible weeds. And that image is then sent to an oceanographer who basically takes a, a pencil and traces over the areas the algorithm has identified and confirms which ones have the highest probability of being weeds or not. Um, so that's how the, the system works. And then once the weeds show up on screen, uh, they'll show up in, in different colors. Um, and it's also important to note that because of the reflectivity of the water close to shore, there are too many false positives. So we're not, in most cases, most shorelines within 20 miles of the coast, we're not able to accurately show you where the weeds are. The weed predictions are more for offshore information than they are for close to shore. And as there's a lot of variables that have to do with that, the, one of the key ones is, is water depth and the reflection the, uh, when the bottom, the, the, the bottom of the water shows through, the, the surface underneath shows through and reflects back, it gives us false positives. So uh, typically you won't see much weed information close to shore. Now, as I was saying, the, the weeds on screen will show up in different colors, and this is giving you the age of the data. Because we can only get a shot once a day, and because this image is impacted by cloud cover, we're not always going to be able to see weeds. Weeds also, as you probably well know, move with currents and wind, and they can disperse and break up. For these reasons, we put three days worth of 
we data in the feed. And the color will change depending on what age the weed is. So here we've, we've selected, and you can also click right on a spot and it'll give you the, the timestamp of, of that weed information. Um, so you can see these darker images and up here we're showing you the time is the 7th of May. So the earlier image was the 5th of May and the later image was the 7th of May. And also on the legend, it's giving you that shading of light to dark so you can tell uh, whether it's new data or old data. Now, because of the fact that the weeds are, are hard to follow and, and because we have things like wind and, and clouds that get in the way, we've put all three days on the feed and we've set up a loop feature, which you can turn on. So what it will do is it will play you a loop of basically three days in a row. So here we're looking at the 6th of April. Now we're looking at the 7th of April. Now we're looking at the 8th of April. So you can see that three day flow of how the weeds have been moving. So you can get a better idea uh, of if, they, if, they're, if it's a large mat that is staying put or we're not staying put, but moving and staying grouped together. You can see which way it's going and, 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 and plan to, to, to intercept. Uh, or if, if, you, if you see weeds on say the, the sixth and nothing on the seventh, and then you see them again on the eighth, well, then that's more than likely because there was cloud cover that caused the, uh, the, the lapse in display. So that's how the, the weed system works. I just say one thing to point out here, Dan, is that, you know, look at the timestamp on your most current weeds and think about how long ago that was and where you are and potentially where the Gulf Stream has taken those weeds. Sometimes can be like finding in a needle in a haystack. But remember, as Dan pointed out, we're only going to show you the most prominent weeds out there. You may come across weeds and say, geez, why is this not in the SiriusXM fish mapping service? Um, we really don't want to show any false positives. And for that very reason, we're not showing small weed lines, really only the prominent ones. Okay, so next and last, fishing recommendations. In addition to showing you all those layers of data, the oceanographers, uh, they look at, they, they have set up a, a specific uh, set of parameters for several different species. And twice a week they go in. And if there is an area where all the parameters are right, all the boxes get ticked for a specific species, then they will uh, give us the position information on that species. Now, as of January 7th, there was a software update. The species list changed. And this is the new species list, billfish, Kingfish, Jeff. Okay. Yeah. Uh, billfish, kingfish, mahi, swordfish, tuna, and wahoo. These are our current species that are in the feed. Uh, there were some variables previous to January seventh. We had uh, you know several varieties of tuna listed, and and that wasn't uh, working out to the best advantage. So we've condensed them basically into a tuna category. Uh, when you have the fishing recommendations turned on, you'll have, the, if you have the legend up on the side, you can see they're color coded uh, and you can see, identify which species is which by the various colors. Uh, the colors do get a little muddled sometimes. Like you can see down here, we've got an orange, two, two basically two shades of orange. What I rec recommend you do is, is turn on the species one at a time and you'll see the different colors show up and you know, maybe just select the species that you're, you're most interested in. However, having said that, we're looking at uh, Wahoo recommendations along here. Just because they're recommending Wahoo, it doesn't mean there might not be other species there. Actually quite the opposite. Wherever you see a fishing recommendation, that tends to mean there's, there's bait fish there. That's one of, the, one of the things that they're looking at. The conditions are right. It just might not have been, the temperature range might not have been exactly right for tuna, but that's not to say you might not stand a very good chance of catching a tuna over one of these other fishing recommendations. So we need to just suggest you use these as a guideline. And, and by all means, don't use just the fishing recommendations. We, we really like to stress that you use all the tools in the toolbox. And going back to the question of layering information, here's a perfect example. 
taken off of, off of Hatteras from Hatteras to Moorhead. I have temperature fronts and plankton fronts turned on. And you can see there's a, a very nice uh, number three plankton front, the green line, and a number four temperature front, the red line. When green and red lines come close together, when temp fronts and plankton fronts come close together, I like to call it Christmas because that's always where you're going to find bait activity. Uh, if you can find these two pieces of information, that's your best uh, best bet to find fish. Um, and then if we add the recommendations on, you can see how they follow, tend to follow the plankton fronts and the temperature fronts. So going back to layering, here is all the information layered for you. Uh, showing that a different way, let's go here and turn on just a blank chart, no layers on. Um, I'm gonna turn on the, the temperature fronts. You can see we've got a nice strong number four front there. Turn on the plankton fronts here again. Now we're starting to see some overlap. This is starting to make sense. And you can see how the, the plankton is building, as I mentioned earlier. We've got a number two, the number three, and number four. You know, this is where you're gonna might start to see a color change happening in the water. And then I've turned on sea surface height anomaly. Well, in this case, there are no upwellings and downwellings. These lines, these orange lines are very far apart. There's one area here where they're saying the sea surface is, is negative 1.96. So it's down just a little bit, but not enough to really create an eddy or a current. And there's, we're, we're only seeing a, a small upwelling. We're not seeing any downwelling activity at all. So this information is not helpful in this case, in this area today, but Look at the fishing recommendations. They are right there on top of those threes and four plankton fronts. So again, I encourage you use all the tools in the toolbox, use the layers in combination with one another and find the, the set that works best for you. Also, I mentioned earlier on the, along these front lines, it's not uncommon to see weeds building up because there is a slight rip current created by these fronts off times. And it might not be weeds big enough for our, us to be able to show but a small scattered weed along those lines. Uh, I've come across it several times running offshore. You run across one of these lines and you'll see a, 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 a small collection of weeds. Lastly, again, we talked, Jeff asked me earlier about showing the bathymetry. So here is a split screen. I have my fishing chart turned on on the left-hand side, and I have the fish mapping chart on the right-hand side. Um, and you can see exact same location, Hatteras Island is showing up, and you can see where the bathymetry is. And if we were physically there, then of course the boat position would show up on both of those screens at the same time. So you could see exactly where that is. And here again, you can see how the, the plankton and the temperatures are also building up along that ledge. All right, let's see if we have some questions here. Um, yes, the weeds, big, big mats of sargassum. It has to be big uh, in, or you won't see it. So there was a question. Right. And regarding that, uh, East Coast, sargassum and, and, and plankton bloom, those are, those, are, those are weed information. On the West Coast, uh, we cannot see kelp. The reflectivity that we mentioned earlier doesn't work the same. Um, so uh, we're not able to show you uh, areas where there are kelp. Uh, for your West Coast fishermen. All right, uh, let's see if there's any more questions. Working in all geographies, I, I was just touching on that about West Coast not being able to show uh, kelp. So for, for the, the West Coast, um, the, uh, the fishing recommendations for the species we have, for the species that are on the West Coast, then yes, that information is good. Um, I'm hearing from people in the Pacific Northwest Territory that are uh, very keen on the upwelling and downwelling information, and they're very keen on the plankton information. So what you may find is, is on, on the West Coast, you know, you may find different layers that you may use to, more to your advantage than on the East Coast and vice versa. New England as well, in our webinar last year, we had a perfect example of a very strong SST front or sea surface temperature front with a plankton front. Uh, where was that? Off of Newport, Rhode Island or somewhere out in that area, Dan. Um, and it was it, it's super useful information for regardless of where you are. Sea surface temperature and plankton in particular, two features that are used 
regardless of where you are. All right, any other questions? Uh, is there any portable unit capable of receiving fish mapping? I have an old Garmin um, and need to upgrade. Yeah, no, not at this time. Um, and there was a specific question, uh, Steve, about, um, about your service. Just uh, we're gonna give everybody our contact information after this. If there's any specific questions about your plotter or your service, or problems you're having or feedback you wanna give or success stories, we're gonna give you all of our contact information so we can work through those uh, potential issues with each and every one of you as needed. All right, let's keep going here. John, if you're not on mute, if you would jump in on this one. Sure, absolutely. Um, so as we said before, you do need a GXM 54 in order to get this uh, fish mapping feature and then a current Garmin uh, multifunction display. So and that even goes back to our 7600 series, 8600 series. I noticed somebody had a 1042 XSV on here, but they had the old GXM 53. They could upgrade to the 54 and then get the fish mapping service on that. So right now, um, price on the GXM 54 is 799. And then we do, we are offering the $100 rebate until the end of the year. Remember too, that you get your uh, antenna and then your power and audio module that you'll see there just below the antenna. This unit is actually connected through ethernet. So it'll go into one of either two or four Ethernet ports, depending on how many you have on your Garmin MFD. When you do network those ports together with multiple MFDs on board, you can be able to do separate screens, or if you have just a single screen on the unit, as the guys were showing, you can do a combo and split that screen if you needed to see um, separate detail on either one of the screens. Um, also remember too, that for new subscribers, when you're subscribing to Fish Mapping, please call 1-844-342-0665 and then ask for your one month free trial offer of Fish Mapping. All right, let's see if there's any questions here related to what you just covered, John. Um, the 740 map, does that carry Fish Mapping, John? The 740 does not. Okay. The 742, 743 will. Um, and then, like I said before, the 7600s will. Okay. And so then with, with the newest software update, too. And that's, I think we'll get to that in a second here. You just want to make sure that you're running the current, most current software update on both your GXM54 and on your multifunction display. Yep, and tell us about the swap out for GXM 53 to 54. Can you simply swap out the antenna, John? You want to talk about that? Uh, you can. You can actually use the same um, power and audio module, and then just the puck that you see there will plug into that. So that's where all the brains are of the unit itself. Great. Um, we'll talk about radio here in just a minute, guys. And uh, first, we're going to talk about software. So this is our Garmin landing page for software updates, how to do your software update. We do, number one, recommend that you do your software update through Active Captain. So for those of you using Active Captain, you'll see that under your One Helm and AV Engages. Download that to your smart device, either tablet or phone. You'll get an alert that there's a software update available. Also, you want to make sure, you know, am I running my most current software on uh, my GXM54? So if you go into home, on the water, GXM54, updates and downloads, that's on our Garmin webpage. You can see what change history is with each one of our devices. And in this example, I just grabbed a screen grab off, and that shows the update. Um, which is currently running the most current version of 3.00 on the GXM54. Uh, you can also go into your uh, MFD. And if you take a look at here, it's simply going into settings, communications, and marine network. So remember, this is Ethernet or network-based device. 
And that's going to show all our devices that are on the network. In this example, I actually have a 1243-8612 XSV, both running the most current software as of just a couple of days ago. And then my GXM54 is running the most current. Make sure your GXM54 is powered on. So if you notice, that's got a separate 12 volt power. Make sure that that's powered on. Generally, what I'll do is I'll come to this page when I'm performing a software update, and then I can actually see it go from the old version, maybe 2.40, to the newest 3.00. Yep, and just remember, everybody, we will send you a recording of this and give you our contact information. All right, so the service itself is $99.99 a month. Uh, this is what we call a superset. So as I mentioned a couple times earlier, it includes all of the offshore weather, which is our highest tier of weather service. Fish mapping has all of that. Uh, and then the eight dedicated uh, fish mapping specific features that we just went through. This is a fixed cost. That $99.99 stays the same. It doesn't go up and down depending on how much data you use. You can see our entire coverage area, which I showed you at the very beginning of this presentation. Um, so there's no extra fees for the amount of data that you use. Also, we encourage people, especially people in this uh, call that are not using their boats all the time. Maybe you're in the New England area. Maybe your boat's up on the hard or getting repair work done. Um, if you're not using the service, don't deactivate it. Just put it in seasonal suspend. You can seasonal suspend for up to six months, uh, once a year. And uh, simply all you have to do is call in to our marine and aviation line and let them know, I'm not using my boat, can you suspend me? And then you give them an actual date you want that suspend turned back on. An activation signal will be sent to your, um, your weather receiver and wake it back up at that time. And your account more or less will just be put in escrow and no charges will be made. There's no reactivation fee. It is way simpler to seasonal suspend than deactivate every year. If you deactivate, you have to call back in, sign back up, pay a reactivation fee, et cetera. So we encourage people to seasonally suspend when they're not using their service. All right, uh, obviously our claim to fame is Sirius XM, uh, our brethren on and sisters on the uh, radio side of the business. Uh, we encourage everybody to add radio. And when you actually add radio to the same subscription to your weather subscription or fish mapping subscription, you get roughly about a 30% uh, break on your radio. Uh, fees. So uh, all the news, all the channels that you're used to uh, hearing, you can sign up for and then have uh, coming through your GXM 54. We did want to let people know on this call, especially those that are avid Mahi uh, fishermen and women, um, that we have partnered with a, a company called the Dolphin Fish Research Program, otherwise known as the DRP. The DRP is providing critical data uh, for the mahi species. I know a lot of us on this call go out and fish and don't think twice about pulling in a lot of mahi. Maybe you're on a weed line. Um, and right now, there's already been almost 30,000 mahi tagged since 2002 through this DRP program, and, and about almost a uh, little over 700 that have been recaptured. This provides critical data about the uh, species. Uh, and their migratory nature. So we're encouraging everybody on this call for free um, to request a free tagging kit by visiting dolphintagging.com forward slash tags. Once you get accustomed to the tagging process and there's several videos on how to tag, it literally will take you 30 seconds to a minute. If you've limited out on mahi or if you've got smaller mahi that you know you're not keeping, why not plop a tag in them and, and help, uh, help research? So we're encouraging people to do that dolphintagging.com forward slash tags. Thanks for supporting that cause. All right, last but not least, some resources for you. And when we send you back out the recorded version of this fish mapping webinar, we're also gonna send you our fish mapping, Garmin fish mapping how-to videos, which will break down each feature individually. But um, we do have a, a website, SiriusXM, uh, dot com forward slash marine. That's our general website for weather uh, and fish mapping. And then we have a specific fish mapping website, seriousxm.com forward slash fish mapping. Also have a video library specific to your brand of display. That's seriousxm.com forward slash marine library and a YouTube channel. Uh, we have a whole host of videos on YouTube 
Um, so visit us on our various video resource channels. Also encouraging people to follow us both on, both on Facebook and uh, Instagram. All right, we will definitely answer some more questions, but before we do that, uh, we wanted to let you know about the resources. If there's any questions about this webinar, about your, your plotter, about your service, about anything SiriusXM related, go to marine.support at SiriusXM.com. Or if it's a Garmin technical question, maybe you have some issues with your chart plotter or your hardware, marine.training at garmin.com. John, remind me, that goes right to you, correct? Uh, yes, and a team of other people. And then we also have a 1-800 number too that goes right to our product support. Um, okay. That's 1-800-800-1020. Got it, thank you. And it's also important to note that this is a specific call number that goes to our Marine and Aviation Call Center. Uh, we have heard calls from people in the past who just uh, you know, Googled SiriusXM and called the general call numbers and really had a hard time getting to our specific Marine and Aviation Department. So um, if you do need support and you don't want to email marine.support at SiriusXM.com, which we encourage, and you want to specifically call, um, call here, or if you're just signing up and you want to get your free trial offer, uh, this is your number that you need. Yeah, for right. anyone that, uh, that happens to be in the Bahamas, occasionally I get uh, calls or inquiries from the Bahamas and you can't use the toll free number, uh, you can email Marine Support and ask them to call you and they'll call you back uh, if, you, if you can't use the 800 number. We're happy to do that. And before we get to remaining questions, um, Ryan, anything else from your end, how you use fish mapping, plankton, fish re recommendations? Tell us maybe a brief experience that you've had. Absolutely. Uh, I use it quite frequently. As a matter of fact, um, last summer, I started using it prior to last summer. I'd use it periodically every other month when we were fishing in between fronts and stuff out of Tampa Bay and, and whatnot. And, and when I came down to Key West for season, um, I was I was starting to get pretty good at using it, finding what worked and, you know, what didn't, how to how to read it and understand the features it has. And as soon as I came down to Key West, um, the first day I went into a, a strong temperature front strength, a number four with a plankton overlay on it and a really, really nice, you know, 10.5 SSH or what we call a telemetry, the upwelling. And uh, it was all overlaid. There was a, a nice mark on it, thanks to fishing recommendations. And um, it was really that was that was where I was going in the first 15 minutes we got a 400 pound blue marlin uh, we jumped a white off and uh, caught a sail at the end of the day caught a couple gaffer dolphins it was good we went back to back in there caught other fish raised raised a few more billfish other boats caught quite a few billfish and we could follow that piece of water for days on end um, over a course of about a four or five day period thanks to fish mapping Awesome. Yeah, great story. And if, by the way, if anybody on this call has similar stories or, or you know, maybe you're, you're just getting the service and will have stories, please communicate those. We love hearing people's success stories and, and happy to support if people have, you know, questions, concerns, need, uh, you know, other support as well. Thanks, Ryan. All right, um, we are gonna stick around for a few minutes. Let's see if there's any questions. Um, we will definitely email out the YouTube link and the recording of this. And John, I think there was a question. Active captain question. Yeah, yeah, you, you wanna answer that one? Yeah, absolutely. So number one, let me see here. It says, uh, how do I get active captain? So active captain is a free app for both Android and Apple devices. So download that to your smartphone or your tablet. And then at that point, you'll create a, a, an account and then on your Garmin MFD, you'll connect that via Wi-Fi. And once you connect that via Wi-Fi, you'll put a formatted SD card in your uh, Garmin MFD. Now those devices are all linked together. So for example, if you did see a software update that's available on your Active Captain on your phone, for example, you'll get an alert 
You can lo- download that, let's say when you're away from your boat on your, your home Wi-Fi. So you've downloaded that. Once you get to the vessel and you connected to your MFD through Wi-Fi, point-to-point Wi-Fi, it will update all your devices that are on your network. So anything that's turned on, radar, MFDs, GXM54s will all be updated together. You can go to Garmin support page, and if you just search for active captain videos, we walk you through step-by-step as a new owner of active captain and actually how to utilize that feature in the app itself. And I think that probably answered the two questions. Good. Uh, Any other questions, John and Dan and I and, and Ryan will stick around just for a few minutes. If you guys even have specific questions, Happy to answer those while we are uh, still live here. So keep the chats coming uh, if you got some. If not, we'll wrap up here in just a minute or so. But thank you all for those that uh, have uh, joined us for this evening. Really appreciate you joining us. Hopefully this was informative and keep in touch, please.